Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the fourth Aliens Among Us webinar Q&A. So it's great to have you all here. I'm coming to you from Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation. Some people would call this Sydney. And I am so um, pleased to acknowledge the indigenous land I'm, I'm on. Think about what was here before Sydney was constructed all the plants and the animals and that um, intact indigenous culture that uh, called this place home. So welcome many indigenous people in this webinar. And, and I give respects to any elders, the elders in this land and any elders with us today too. So um, I'm Andrew Cox, I'm the CEO of the Invasive Species Council and I'm as I mentioned, this is our fourth Aliens Among Us, where we get to talk about invasive species and really um, get you to hear from some really interesting people in the invasive species world. So earlier this year, the newly elected Labor government, Labor federal government, released the 2021 State of Environment Report. These come out every five years, and this one was a bit delayed because of the election um, and luckily now we have got a chance to see it and gosh what a what a story it has to tell um, it's a pretty sad story of environmental decline I guess we all knew this but the thousands of pages of the state environment report talks about how the environment has really uh, suffered from human threats. And it, in particular, it confirms that invasive species are right at the center of Australia's extinction crisis. So we've got cats, we've got rabbits, we've got root, rock, root rot, pigs, lantana, and just that plethora of invasive species that make, make invasive species now one of the biggest, if not the biggest threats to Australia's environment. There have been over 100 extinction in Australia's colonization, since colonization, and invasive species introduced by humans were involved in just about 80% of them. So, and they're the leading cause behind 45% of those extinctions. So now, uh, and even now, they're pushing 82% of Australians' threatened wildlife closer to extinction. So earlier this year, um, when I attended the launch of the State of the Environment Report at a National Press Club function with uh, the Minister for the Environment um, and some of our team, we've been reading through this and um, we've been obviously talking to our decision makers just to really uh, I guess, ask them to address the problem that's been identified in the report. But I wanted to really focus this webinar on speaking to some of the people who know intimately about the details of this report. And I'm really honoured today to have a special guest with us, Barry Hunter, a descendant from the Jibugai speaking people of the Cairns hinter region, hinterland region. He has decades of experience in conservation in mining industry, community and not-for-profit organizations and environmental consultants, consultancy and Aboriginal affairs, of course. And please welcome Barry, who's calling in today from Darwin. Barry, hello. Uh, hello, Andrew. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, and, and my, my, I'm calling in from um, the land of the Laraki people in, in Darwin, but yeah, my traditional country is, is Japagai. Um, and Jirabul, which is um, at the southern end of the Tablelands and, and uh, Jabagoi being up to the north sort of um, in the hinterland from Cairns. Fantastic, yeah, and we're so grateful to have you here as one of the co-authors of the State of Environment Report, and that's, I think that's one of the innovations of this report that's set aside, and I think uh, it's great to have your perspective. So also joining us today, we have author and biologist and co-founder of the Invasive Species Council, Tim Lowe. Welcome, Tim. Um, hi, Andrew. It's um, great how far we've come, this being a 20th year as an organisation that we're now running these events. It's a big step up, this and everything else. Right, and what land are you calling from, Tim, this morning? 
I'm from Brisbane, but I'm not I'm not used to giving traditional welcome, so I won't try and fumble that. Thanks, Tim. All right. Uh, yes, 20 years. Um, what, what an achievement. And we're also joining us, we have our Indigenous ambassador, Richard Swain, uh, our newest panellist. Uh, welcome, Richard. Hello, everyone. And g'day, Andrew. How are you? Where are you calling from? Um, at, at the moment, I'm on Manaru, the Monero, and um, I'm a Radri descendant. And where I live at Numerala, it's just out the back of my paddock is the the Great Divide, which is the Yuan country is just, so I'm, I live right on the border of Yuan and Manaru. Fantastic, thanks. And just uh, uh, to, a quick note, we normally would have our other ambassador, Christine Milne, uh, with us, but unfortunately she couldn't, couldn't make it today. So hello everybody who's tuned in. Um, we've got over a hundred people joining us today. Uh, and look, this is an interactive session, so we want to make sure you can ask your questions. So if you look down the bottom of your screen, and if your screen's too small, there might be a more button. There's a Q&A option. There's also a chat option. Don't use that. That's for the, that's if you want technical support, but the Q&A option is for your questions, which we hope to get to uh, many of them uh, later on in, in this discussion. So enter your questions as we go, and then we'll try to get through them. Um, all right, so just we're here to talk about the state of environment report, and that report says invasive species are doing to Australia's environment what they're doing to the Australia's environment. But first, we need to clarify what the report really is. So, I'm going to um, really I'm going to ask Barry a bit more about this report because he was one of the 37 authors behind this report, uh, one of a number of Indigenous authors. So Barry, can you just to get this started, just uh, tell us a bit more about this report. How does it happen to, for you to become an author? And um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the process? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I guess um, so. Everyone would be aware that you know that that the State of Environment Report is is um, released every five years, and it is a statement on on. On what we see um, on a day-to-day -day basis in and around country, and and what that um, state looks like in terms of its condition, um, and there's a number of ways to to look and measure um, uh, that condition, um, and that's basically what the re report is, and covers a whole range of things around um, between land, coastal, uh, marine, um, but also looks at biodiversity, air quality. So there's there's a um, and I encourage people to jump on there and, and have a look at the State of the Environment Report. Um, how, how I became involved, um, I was recommended by an organisation to, as one of, um, to become one of 12 Indigenous authors involved in the theme areas and the theme that I was um, um, attached to and, and became um, an, a, a joint author on was uh, the land section, um, the land theme. Um, and that was an interesting exercise to be able to one. Um, um, first of all, it, it is a sort of a highly academic um, process to be able to sort of collect and gather um, all of that information that that we know that sits out there in the data. Um, but then to be exposed to it um, is also confronting, um, not just because of the the massive information that it is, but um, because of the story that it tells that you're you're, you're talking to now. Um, so yeah, I was privileged to be selected and be one of the 12 Indigenous authors um, involved in those various themes. And um, we were involved right across the themes by the um, uh, Arctic and um, and the clean air um, theme, I think. Um, every, all the other themes had Indigenous authors um, that contributed to it. Um, and I guess, Working within the process um, with the Australian government and with also with those co-authors that range across from organisations like CSIRO to um, um, to academics and academic institutions, um, as well as sort of government people. Um, yeah, yeah, a wide range of collaboration. Fantastic. Yeah, look, I've I've noticed a big difference. Uh, there's, uh, it's really refreshing to see. So. 
did, I guess this is your first time being involved, but do you, do you, what do you think of the difference it made having those 12 Indigenous authors being having such a central part in the way the report um, was compiled? I can only go on the words of um, um, of the um, Indigenous Advisory um, Committee to the um, EBBC Act, um, and that's the government committee when when they and those members then spoke of the last report and said that they had a week um, to include Indigenous involvement in the last report. Um, and so this is a very different process, Andrew, and I think, um, yeah, welcome and also um, uh, commend the Australian government um, for engaging and taking this process. Um, so, yes, yeah, big step. Yeah, great. All right. And we've already had a question come in. So just a reminder, put your questions in the Q&A down the bottom, not the chat, but the Q&A. And the question was saying, look, is this report public? Yes, of course, it's a public. It was released uh, uh, a few months ago now. Um, it's on the website. I think you just Google um, the State of Environment Report and make sure you pick the 2021 version. And I think that um, if you look in the q and I think you can see that was uh, answered. So that link should be there. Um, I'm going to hand. I'm going to talk to Richard now because um, Richard, you might be interested in this difference it's making by better involving Indigenous people in these really um, landmark reports like this. Do you think um, this style of engagement just should become um, more normal? Is is this where we're heading? What do you think about it? Oh, very much. Um... I believe we all need to be aware that it's not 1970, it's 2022, and we're going to have to make some rapid decisions. And, and we also need to understand we're all in, the, in this together. And so, yeah, everything's welcomed and, and Australia won't change until it changes its culture. And changing its culture is going to have to become more connected and and obviously the Aboriginal people are the best to look at to, to see that and to see the the level of custodianship that was around for many thousands of generations and um, so hopefully there can be an invitation to the modern Australians now to to fulfill their responsibility as custodians and and then then we can make some changes um, the state mm -hmm. of the environment wouldn't way it, it does if we had a, a much more connected culture and um, so yeah I hope modern Australian culture and, and governments does accept our our long history of custodianship and does and does decide to start caring for the species that that evolved here. Yeah thanks Richard it makes so much sense and um, just talking just staying a little bit more on um, the uh, con content in the State of Environment Report and the Indigenous voice through that. Uh, I was going to turn to Tim because there has been in the past some, some academics, not sure how many, Tim, um, who maybe have maybe talked up the benefits of invasive species, but not necessarily uh, highlighted the, the impacts. Do you want to speak to that, Tim? Yeah, it's one of the big trends I've noticed in the last 20 years. This increasingly large number of academics, I mean, they're represented in most universities in Australia who are, are saying that invasive species are really a beat up, that it's not a real category of being, uh, that we shouldn't care whether something's native or introduced, we should just enjoy all species in the land. And one of the um, commonly used arguments is that, well, look at Indigenous people, they you can't deny their connection with the land, they, they welcome cats, rabbits, donkeys, camels, and so on. Um, I don't, yeah, there was a book, um, Animal Nation, Adrian Franklin, in 2006, and he had a whole chapter on this and saying, we should follow their lead and embrace feral animals. And I mean, what I find interesting is, you know, you look at the Indigenous chapter in the State of Environment Report, and there's, there's none of this, oh, you know, we should welcome the camels and the feral animals. It is, we should be really concerned about them. And I think that... Um, there, there was a case, say, 20 or 30 years ago, you could say that, I mean, you know, Indigenous people, they don't like the idea of shooting for waste. So the idea that you just kill foxes and let them rot, that's 
you know, there's a there's a sense that if you kill something, it should be for for to use it. So so there were cultural values. That, the fact that uh, donkeys uh, and camels were in the Bible that had some sway with communities. Mm. But as the numbers of these animals have increased greatly, and the impacts have become much worse, like polluting um, desert water holes, the attitudes are really sharpened uh, dr dramatically. And so it's now out of date to say that there is this separation that you can talk about. Indigenous people liking feral animals and greenies in the cities disliking them, that that split doesn't exist. Yeah. What, Barry, what do you think about that? Yeah, exactly. Um, what, what Tim just said, I, I think it, it's, it shouldn't be reflected that just because there's a perception of some sort of cultural connection, we know that cultural connection isn't, isn't long historic. Um, you know, there's, there's longer connection to those species um, um, that people would be more familiar with over and have grown with over the last um, sets of millennia that we've experienced. Um, and I just want to make another sobering observation that the, the standard environment report um, had pointed out that there are now more invasive species in Australia than there are natives, which, which is quite alarming, you know, like that's a real sobering fact. So, Yeah, great. Well, sobering, yes, not, you know, not that exciting. Um, I was going to just now look a bit more deeper at the um, some of this information that's in the State of Environment Report. I, I have a factoid that sort of was quite alarming for me that uh, in the report, and in the report, you look at the two, there's two main sections that deal with invasive species. There's the biodiversity section, but there's also the land section. And that's the section that Barry um, was uh, one of the co-authors of. And it said that one third of all introduced species were actually introduced since 1970. Uh, so that's quite alarming, weeds, pests and the like. So it's actually a recent thing. And they said that the rate is not slowing down. And then they also said, the, the report also says, at, the, at our borders, which how we try to keep these out, uh, 37 interceptions per year sorry, 37,000 interceptions per year of biosecurity risk material. That's really worrying. So now I'm, I'm gonna move on to our next sort of, um, you know, just staying with what's in the report a bit more. So what one thing that the um, report shows is the growing understanding of the nature of the invasive species threat. So for example, in 2001, the second state of environment report, invasive species were identified as a major threat. So 10 years later in 2011, invasive species were one of the two most common pressures for wildlife on Australia's threatened species. And then now um, in this latest report published this year, but completed last year, invasive species are singled out as being the most common pressure on threatened native wildlife. And the report actually goes on to say that invasive species are consistently identified as the most prevalent threat to Australian animals. So I might ask the next question of Tim. So Tim, in your book, Feral Future, which you first published in 1999, um, which led to our organization being formed, but it's a long time ago. Um, so that's just before those these that, that first state of environment report I mentioned. So you've been deeply involved in invasive species issue um, since. So what, are, what, is, what is this change in the state of environment report telling us about our growing recognition of the problem and also maybe um, whether the government's actually taking more notice? Yeah, I think the pests are getting worse and the awareness is getting worse. So uh, I was on the Federal Environment Minister's Advisory Committee in 2006 when the um, State of Environment report was released in that year. And when I looked at what it had to say about invasive species, I was just so angry that we, we actually had uh, the, um, the chief editor um, briefing us. And I went up to him afterwards and said, you, you have not dealt with invasive species properly. Like I, I, it was interesting, I went and had a look at it on the weekend, that particular report, and I just got angry again. I mean, it, just the capacity of some biologists not to get this issue. So. Uh, in that volume, you can see it's very much a historical issue. You know, there's recognition that foxes and cats have been bad, but not the idea that we should be doing something about it now. And that where I think you can really see that most dramatically is if you look at this state environment report, 
the word biosecurity comes up more than 30 times. If you go back to that 2006 report, people were using the word quarantine much more than biosecurity then. Neither word comes up in that report. So doing something about airports, about what's coming into the country, that was not in that state of environment report, except in the marine section. So the marine biologist was onto it. But in terms of all the uh, habitats on land, there was no feeling that if you wanted a better Australian environment, you should watch out about what was coming in through imported goods and travel. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Look, there's a few questions coming through. Someone asked, are foreign trees an invasive species? Absolutely. Um, well, I guess if they, I mean, there's plenty of exotic trees that just sit in one place and don't spread, but it's those ones that spread that are, are the invasive species that uh, spread across the landscape. So yes, they can be. And another question, sort of uh, question, uh, Vicky mentioned that uh, her main area of concern are feral cats. Now, I probably want to shift to Richard and ask you a bit of question about your front seat view about invasive species. You've been thinking about it and doing practical work on uh, the threat of invasive species for a big chunk of your life. So before you don't have to talk about cats, but I was going to just ask you about feral horses first. Uh, and uh, this, I guess what I'm interested in is um, how have you seen invasive species change the country around you over the years? You know, talk about horses, but you can also talk about other invasive species that are that are, you've you've noticed in the landscape. Oh, uh, well, as a as a as a boy, we didn't have feral goats, or or we didn't have deer. Uh, we now have a lot more feral species and a lot less native species. The 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 country is going silent around here. We're, we're losing a lot, hand over fist. Um, the issue with the feral horses, in particular, is that is a cultural issue. We 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 are protecting feral horses over and above our native species for for a certain people's view of what Australian culture should be, and and that uh, we sh we should allow accept the naturalization of some of these feral animals, even against the fact that they're going to cause extinctions. And uh, we're getting down to the, to the end of it here, like, um, and, and we have an opportunity to turn this around. And that, that's why, why I work so hard on, on that issue, because that issue is cultural. That, that's where we really, we're making a decision to send things extinct, uh, to make some people feel better. And uh, I, I'd like us to save what's left. Uh, the, the other day, I just spent four days walking national parks down a very good quality, almost pristine river. And we found an endangered plant in there. We basically doubled the world's population of uh, citrus zyeria. Uh, we found two colonies of it. But on the same walk, we, there were feral goats, there were feral deer, um, all through that country. And, and the goats are really the reason that that plant is endangered, uh, grazing goats and other grazing animals. So we're not even at the moment protecting the really good areas. It, it's, you know, we, we might have feral animals across a lot of our landscape, um, but at the moment we, we're not even protecting the really clean areas that we, we can look after. So I find that... Mm. It, just a disaster in, in waiting. Barry, would you agree? And um, oh, actually, uh, there's a provocative couple of questions also coming um, through the Q&A, which is also saying humans are our worst invasive species. Um, mm. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, look, I, I think um, what pro probably the best thing to comment on in, in this context, Andrew, is going back to what Tim said. Um, and in terms of the report, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, there is a critical disconnect there between um, what the government will do in response. Um, and, and that's by no means um, reflective of, of the actions that we already have around, you know, the review of the EPBC Act and, and those, those um, sort of things that are happening at a, at a federal level. But nonetheless, there's a disconnect there. And, and again, using Tim's word, you know, there, sh there should be real anger about this. There should be, um, you know, the expression and, and what um, Richard was just outlining that, 
Um, you know, like, where, where does the action come from? Yeah, it, it, it certainly does start locally and it can occur with, with um, you know, individuals going out and, and playing an active role. Um, but, you know, what, what's there to back us up at those sort of straight um, and federal um, uh, legislative and regulatory levels, um, and, and particularly where arguments become a motive, such as the, the horse and cause USCO. So, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of context to unpack there. Do you think it's just uh, the role of government or do we have, uh, do all of us have a role here? I mean, someone just mentioned that we need a picture book about invasive species to raise awareness. I guess that might help. Um, it's not just government, is it, Barry? No, and look, I'll, I'll let um, um, particularly yourself and Tim comment on on those actions that community have stepped forward to um, actively in this space. But I know, um, you know, within my area um, that, that there's a number of steps and activities in regards to dealing with um, um, key invasive species. Um, and, and those things have come from at community level. So, yeah, it does start there at community level. Tim, do you want to comment? I mean, there's also uh, people actually getting in and doing stuff themselves, but uh, as one of the Q&A uh, questions asked or suggested is uh, sometimes there's lots of rules in place, to, the way we, we control whether it's um, feral dogs or feral, sorry, feral goats, feral deer. Um, uh, there might be some regulations about how we you know, use pesticides and herbicides. Um, so what do you think about the role we can all play. Well, I think there was a Mr. Beale review of quarantine, wasn't it? Saying that yes, you know, the continuum of quarantine is what we need. The idea that you just have border controls to keep stuff out. The reality now is that um, new species are appearing in Australia, being seen for the first time anywhere. You know, out, out in the community, and therefore uh, naturalists, people who are, have got their eye on a strange plant at the side of the road, can be making very important finds. And, and I think uh, digital photography, um, phone apps, you know, we live at an amazing time in history where the potential for um, mobilising people with cameras and phones and apps um, on online resources to get that feedback back to governments when, when something, you know, when some suspicious insect or plant or animal is found. But I think the other important part of that is that we want governments, we want political parties to go to elections saying <clears throat> we will spend more on biosecurity and you know, we, we will give more to the northern ranges to um, look for stuff along the northern coast of Australia and have political parties um, um, <clears throat> off making those bids. It depends on a community that's awake to invasive species as an issue. And, and I see this, um, uh, you know, there's a cir circular process here whereby the more you can get the community engaged in looking out for insects, and using apps, then the more likely they are to notice polit what political parties are saying and encourage them to, to put more funding into this, this area. Yeah, that's a really good um, point, Tim. And uh, I mean, we're, um, for example, the Invasive Species Council, um, we're just trialling some citizen science um, applications, some apps around invasive insects. And uh, so that certainly, I noticed the State Environment Report was mentioning citizen science and that sort of growth in that is a really big positive um, right now. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm certainly interested in, you, you touched on in Indigenous ranger programs and we, we know that the, uh, that's being increasingly supported. Um, Barry and Richard, maybe Barry first, did you, what, what's your, what have you seen about the the good news about the Indigenous Ranger program that's range programs are happening in Australia. Yeah, well, first and foremost, Andrea, welcome um, the election commitment from um, this incoming uh, or this now Labor government um, in, in, to increase Indigenous Rangers. Um, so that's that's a big step. Um, and I guess, you know, like they mentioned um, programs in and around innovation, but the only true innovation will occur when, when we, we see that um, that the critical work that needs to be done and we know that there's a number of examples um, become specialised and what I mean by that is is that um, rangers do a whole lot of stuff um, and we know that the type of work that they do around cult between cultural and natural um, resource management um, but when we're talking about biosecurity um, and, and indeed um, um, border security um, they're specialised roles 
Um, so being able to recognise that, you know, and, and, and I can only speak on the example of around Northern Australia, where we've got, you know, some roughly 14,000 um, kilometres of coastline um, to, to manage and protect, um, that, you know, there, there are a few and far between in terms of the examples where this work has been undertaken, um, certainly the Jalk Ranges up in Mount Greta, um, Northern Territory, and also within the Torres Strait are, are, are great examples. Um, and, and I know that, that those um, types of entities as, as well as those exercises have been funded. Um, but again, it's sort of with that sort of pilot lens on um, from the government. So in order to get secure, um, serious about this, there still needs to be a lot more work and, and specialised training around that as well. And Barry, I'm presuming all these in, Indigenous ranger programs around the country are probably focusing mostly on invasive species. Would that be right, on invasive species control? There's a fair bit of work around invasive species, but again, you know, like I go back to um, the types of activities, um, the range of activities that are undertaken by um, Indigenous land and sea centres is, is, is pretty vast. Um, so loading them up with more and more work is not necessarily the answer. It's more around becoming specialised and, and saying that invasive species and, um, and biosecurity um, are defined fields that need to be um, and should attract um, key investment. So I guess that's more the issue, Andrew. Yeah, I've, I've been noticing a few new Indigenous ranger programs appearing in states like Victoria and New South Wales, but they're certainly... Uh, aren't as many as I've noticed in the top end. Richard, what do you say about, um, is there something going on that's preventing or sort of um, uh, limiting um, the establishment of Indigenous ranger programs in sort of Southeastern Australia? Uh, well, Southeastern Australia was, has been knocked about uh, for Aboriginal people. The, the, um, the invasion here was pretty tough. Um, but I, I welcome the... The, the changes that that are coming, you know, that cultural shift within parks. Like a, I, I wish the park ranger was was a custodian of country, and and I look forward to that being a caring for country custodian, permeating parks. At, at the moment, if you want to find a, a young Kurrajong in the lower Snowy River, you have to go around the toilet blocks um, because the feral animals are, are eating them all, but they they avoid. So in the thirty Pre previous 30 years we in that area in particular we've got new park benches new toilet blocks and and the roads etc but we've gone from you know um feral rabbits being the the biggest consumer of that environment followed by macropods and native animals um to now horses are the biggest consumer followed by deer followed by rabbits and nearly no macropods. Uh, and, and that's in the 30 years, in the entire time it's supposedly been managed. So I, I look, that's a cultural thing. That's within parks right now that they've allowed that to happen. And um, we, I look forward to Indigenous mindset and connection permeating what it means to be a, a park ranger and a custodian. Yeah, gosh, that's um, we look forward to that, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, right across Australia, but particularly um, in those southeastern states uh, like New South Wales and Victoria. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm going to turn to Tim now because this is a bit about. I just wanted to really drill down and looking at some of the. Uh, we 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 talked a bit about our border controls, but I want to look at the cut flower industry and the way we import most of the. Um, the flowers you see for sale at florists and supermarkets, um, surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, most of those are imported. And with their imported, with, with coming into the country, a uh, lot of insects hitch a ride in these flowers and the contamination rates are quite high. And there was actually a statistic um, that between 2007 and 2017, the amount of contaminated uh, consignments increased from 13% to 58%. So most of those flowers have been contaminated. Obviously, uh, well, since then, the government has done um, quite a bit to tighten those regulations, but there still are detections on those imported flowers. Tim, you've looked at this really closely because I know you're working away at your updated, fully rewritten um, 
uh, feral future that you're hoping to bring out in the next year. Um, what 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 can you tell us about cut flowers and, and the risk they're posing to Australia? I think it's quite shocking that, you know, we've got, I think it's all figures I've got here. Um, I mean, this is before COVID, but, um, you know, like over 100 million flowers coming in fresh. I mean, most of the roses, you know, like some 80 to 90% of the roses that are selling in Australia in supermarkets or anywhere else, they've been grown in Kenya or in South America. Um, if you peel them away, there's a very good chance of them having little aphids in them. And these will be foreign aphids. I mean, the biosecurity services don't bother confiscating imported roses if they find aphids at the border because we've already got the foreign aphids. So um, these aphids, have, they've now got these global, you know, global breeding populations that they're born in a flower farm on another continent and then die in Australia. It's just bizarre. And so we, we know of all sorts of diseases and pests that have travelled to other countries on these flowers. And I mean, it's happening, this huge surge in flower imports because other countries can do it more cheaply. But of course, um, that increases the risk of pests and diseases coming in, which make it more expensive to produce flowers here. So you get this vicious cycle going on. And I, I just think that it's quite remarkable that this is going on. And, you know, like this is globalization gone mad. I mean, you know that any passenger coming in on, on an overseas flight, you're entitled to bring in six bouquets of flowers and just declare them at the border for border inspections. I mean, why are we allowing that? It, it's just this um, idea that personal freedom and freedom of trade are such um, noble endeavours that we've got to um, risk our biodiversity for the sake of that. I, I just think it's um, bizarro land. Yeah, and we're, we're learning the impacts of that because um, <clears throat> last year there was a polyphagus shot hole border detected in Perth. This is a little brown beetle that burrows into trees and plants. Um, should we be worried about that? These, these are some of the consequences. What, what yeah. does it really well, mean? For these that, wouldn't, that wouldn't have come in on flowers, to be fair. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, because that's, you know, it's uh, associated with wood. But yeah, I mean, well, there's every kind of insect doing anything and everything. But um, I mean, in terms of these imported um, flower insects, the most obvious threat is to um, to agriculture. And so you could say that we as an organisation are more concerned for biodiversity. And we just don't know the extent to which these things will, we, well, we know they'll attack native plants, but um, often in the crop, cropping situation because of fertiliser and water, the insects reach really high densities. But, but yeah, there's an infinite potential number of insects that can come in on imported flowers, really. There's huge numbers of species that are, have, have already, you know, have been intercepted, that we've got, got huge lists that, you know, that haven't gotten into the wild yet because only one or two have been found. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, haven't we? Um, I'm just starting to look at the questions a bit now. Just a reminder, um, put your questions in the Q&A and um, we've got a, a huge number of questions. I think we've got over 30 questions already. Um, Tim, um, someone just said, um, how do you go about your um, their invasive species journey, if you like, as they learn more about it? And um, already there's a reply saying, well, they should read your book. Um, has it been a journey for you, your invasive species journey? Um, I remember you telling me when you when you wrote Feral Future, you were not originally planning to um, devote a big part of your life to invasive species. You're going to move on to your next book, but here you are now. and um you're still heavily involved and you're doing the second second of future how's your what's your journey on invasive species like from a personal point of view well i mean i you know i wrote that bird book i just had to get away from it all to think about things that you know see sort of ecological integrity you know going to a, a rainforest in north queensland where everything is still there everything in its place but yeah it, it is um it is quite a journey i mean i think you know, we're accepting that we're moving into more dangerous times. You know, we've got climate change, we've got Putin's war. Um, you know, people are more nervous about the future. So um, I think, you know, when, when you're a writer, you're depending on people actually buying a book and reading it. And I think one fear is that people will say, um, 
uh, there are so many negative things going on in the world. I, I don't want to read about this stuff, and I, I hope that isn't how it turns out. Because, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to have the support of the Invasive Species Council because you know we all know we're dealing with quite a negative topic. You know, you think of what cane toads, foxes, cats, myrtle rust, and so forth are doing. The idea that there are all these other things that some of which will come in in the future. That um, yeah, we, we've got to keep our perspective and be. Um, you know, enjoy, enjoy life, recognise that there is beauty and wonder and lots of reasons to be happy in life. We don't want to get depressed. Yeah, that's that's right. And um, I, there, it can feel overwhelming just because there are so many invasive species already in Australia and they're still arriving. Um, I just, maybe to help us um, while we've got our special guest Barry here and uh, Indigenous Ambassador Richard Swain here, I just thought it might be worth um, sort of hearing from them a bit more um, about, we've sort of touched on this already and some of the questions are talking about both uh, the impact of feral animals and not just the herbivores, but also some of the, the carnivores like foxes and cats. And there's been a there's another question that said, well, are invasive plants the worst invasive species? But what I wanted to ask Barry and Richard is maybe what it means for culture, for your culture, and what invasive species um, mean to you. And are you sort of you know, there's a lot of destruction and loss? Um, maybe just put want to sort of go inside your, your, your shoes for a moment to feel like what the invasive species world that you're living through feels like to you, Barry. Maybe start with Barry. Um, th th thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, look, th there's th pro probably the best way to explain it is to talk in, in practical real life example. Um, and I was um, in a little place called Coranda, um, which is my home, um, up in the Hitkins hinterland. And um, I was almost near ground zero where um, an invasive species called the yellow crazy ant um, had decided to arrive and make its home. Um, and in a short amount of time, uh, because the super colonizers, um, they, they, they took over. Um, and in, in that time, um, the lack of, bird life and the lack of, um, because of the lack of insect, um, the lack of bird life and then the lack of um, small marsupials, um, you know, bandicoots and um, and sort of other little things like that, that would be growing around there, um, had disappeared um, in a short amount of time. It was incredible. Um, and just watching the work um, that our, our rangers had been involved in in that area, the Jabba Bomba rangers, um, to come in and 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 be engaged in, in undertaking that work um, was was great. But for me, it, it it talked on a number of levels. One is 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 that all of those things that I just spoke of within the in the, in that country um, were connected to somehow. Um, you know, there's either story culturally or or, or there's um, um, some level of of connection around um, you know being able to used to see them in the in the community. And that that's what cultural indicators that they tell you if country is healthy or not um, and that was a real life example for me when, when those species weren't there it was real life say well this country's not good and it was so quiet as, as Richard said about his country um, and when when that was changed to the effect and work of the wet tropics and like I said those um, our, our mob and the rangers involved in that that work um, and and we started to see insect and first and foremost green ant come back and I saw that green ant come back and I was like wow look at this you know like First time I've seen green ant for a couple of years in this country, um, but all those things that that cultural connection and it talked to talk to not just spirituality but wellness on country, um, and you know that old saying around when country is well, um, then people are well spiritually as well as mentally. So I think that's that's what it talks to. It's about health and well being, but certainly that cultural connection is a strong part of it. But that was the best probably best example I can give Andrew. Yeah, great. Look, I mean, it's it's so valuable having hearing that about uh, how you feel about uh, the impact of invasive species. And I think that's one of the big benefits of having voices like yours in the State of Environment Report. Uh, it just, um, it just um, makes, it really resonates. So Richard, uh, do you want to add to that? And I mean, you've already talked a bit about um, some of your local examples, but um, how important is 
addressing this invasive species problem for for your culture well this is new ground we you know i have my totems and one of my totems is locally extinct here um and this is new ground we 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 respected animals and we respected how everything fitted within the picture and so the the insect is as important as the bird and the bird is as important as the mammal um and so it's a new reality for for us to to realize that if we, if we don't do something about these invasive species we we're not our totems and our native species are going to go extinct and and that's what's happening so like tim said maybe 30 years ago some people did out of respect for animals etc not think invasive species were such a such a problem but i think we've come to terms now that and we, we've always understood that um there's a huge responsibility when you're when you're a human in this planet and um so we we actually have to accept that that responsibility and 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 make decisions. We we always made decisions about how we treated country and and and, and what rules we're governed by. And um, we we've you know I think most people are happy now to accept that responsibility and and to do what's right by by the ecosystem that 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 evolved here. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, we're going to have to make sure you're on our next panel too. And um, there's just uh, so, so much to think about from what you say. Um, just coming back to the Q&A, um, thanks for all your questions. It's really clear that there's lots of interest in particular invasive species. And there's been quite a few uh, questions on cats. Um, there's been um, questions on deer and, and weeds and particular places. Um, we, we, we'll respond to those after the Q&A because really the purpose of this Q&A was to talk about the state of environment report and sort of the, I guess, the big picture um, and particularly um, with our special guest, Barry Hunter, to hear what one of the Indigenous co-authors has to say and think about these issues. Um, I, there is, and, and one, one, one uh, I'll just read out one comment that someone suggested, because I did talk a bit about how do people sort of go on their invasive species journey and reading Tim books, Tim's book, even though it's out of print and um, it's hard to get hold of, it's a really good starting point. Um, but also someone suggested Judith Wright's book, The Cry for Our Dead, 1981. So that's another um, useful read. Um, there is a there is a question that one of our panelists might be able to answer though. Um, someone was worried about the spread of Asian geckos throughout Australia. Uh, and I know Tim, Tim has a particular interest in geckos. What do you know about Asian geckos and the, the threat of their spread throughout Australia, Tim? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question that's been debated among biologists. So uh, uh, they've been in Australia a very long time. They used when I was a kid, they were called Darwin house geckos because they were mainly around Darwin. Then in the um, 80s, they started turning up along the Queensland coast. It was probably new introductions coming in on ships rather than the ones from Darwin spreading. And then they just exploded all over Queensland. <clears throat> now they, they love buildings and then it's very easy to find them in forest close to buildings. But it, it's not clear whether that's a source and sink situation where you know they, they're breeding up on buildings and then the young ones get pushed out of the forest but don't do very well there. Um, on Christmas Island, I've heard them ride out in the rainforest. Around Darwin, I've heard them ride in the dry rainforest well out of town. So I think they're pushing further and further out. And I think, yeah, there's a real potential for them to push some of the native lizards out. Um, but there's nothing we can really do about it except watch it, watch it happening. Yeah, right. Uh, this is the story, isn't it? Um, more and more, more and yeah, more so, species. Well, let's Tim? keep let, let's keep new reptiles out. Becomes the message. You know, it's that biosecurity becoming the focus. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, all I can say from my vested interest is thank goodness for the Invasive Species Council that sort of tries to make sure more things don't come into the country and we're better at controlling those that are already here. Um, so I, um, there's an interesting question from Doug Lang. Uh, ah. 
Hi, Doug. <laughs> Hello, Doug. Uh, he's been a supporter of ours for a long time, but he made he raised the point about um, the difficulty in explaining the challenge of invasive species, and he uses the example of feral horses in the Alps and how it's so difficult to raise the attention about the plight of the corroboree frog whose uh, habitat's being trampled um, and the sphagnum moss is disappearing thanks to horses and probably in the future deer. But uh, he, he mentioned that if you show people who live in Canberra a glass of clean water and because their water comes from clean catchments not impacted by feral deer and horses, then the penny drops. Uh, do we have a lot of work to do? Or maybe I'll just take it from each of the panelists about how we, um, you know, I guess, persuade people that the invasive species are, are, are an important issue in their own right. Uh, and it's not just about the vested interests of people in the clean water. Obviously, maybe that's the entry point. But um, I might start with you. Tim, then Richard, then Barry, just to talk a bit about um, what Doug has talked about there. Yeah, I think, it's I think you can think about a spectrum of communication. So there's the 10 second sound bite where you know someone could hold up a glass of clean water or an endangered animal. <clears throat> so some sort of quick bit of communication. And then to me, at the very, very deep end is me writing, working for years on a book where I'm trying to convey invasive species, but in the slowest and deepest possible way, and that you need, you know, ev everything in between. And I, you know, I think that any invasive species council, I mean, people like Barry and Richard were all somewhere along that spectrum, you know, communicating. I mean, you know, like Richard with his um, tours down the down the Snowy River, you know, talking to people about invasives that way. That yeah, there's so many different ways to communicate, and we we all find the places where we can. Where we can do it best. Yeah, great. All right, I might ask the same question to Richard, but before I do, just Richard, there was a comment coming in from uh, a Walter, who talked a bit about you, you know you talked a bit about um, duty of care uh, or your responsibility uh, to to do what's right, but he also this Walter talks about the cruelty that might be um, we might need to. Um, do to actually achieve the goals. I'm not saying in any way that we, when we're controlling horses, uh, we're not mindful of cruelty and we're doing it with to minimize that. Mm. But um, you know, this is part of the journey, I think, of understanding what we need to do to solve this big problem. Do you want to speak to that, Richard? Uh, I will. It, I'll go back to that it, it is cultural. Uh, so Australians don't, you don't see them picking up roadkill or or thinking that some feral predators go and get a boom on the amount of roadkill that's killed every night. So it's, it's cultural. It's how we see and think about things. Um, I think if we're going to accelerate the process and like you, you know, showing Canberrans a glass of water, I'd like to see the, the Brumbies put it to a vote and change their name to the Corroborees. Uh, I'd like to see the Indigenous AFL and NRL rounds promote um, extinct or, or very threatened species in, in their jumpers and, and educate through the ticket sales those types of but I'd like to see the children when they get those tickets at those types of events take those animals as their totems. And so for me, it's cultural. I, I believe we can we can hurry this process up if we if we look at the cultural shifts we can do through through what Australians currently you know the mediums that they really currently are affected by um, sports one and and so is even the way we represent tv you know uh, the when you become a new australian when you become a, a citizen you you should take your shoes off and, and you should ha pick up some dirt and, and you should accept the responsibility of custodianship that that's what you should do when you become a, a citizen and, and so there's little shifts. If we just make those little shifts and we promote those little shifts, we, we, we can start to move forward. And the very same people that don't want to um, think 11 dead horses is, is a crime, they've got no idea how many kangaroos might have been shot that night and, and they don't care um, or how many things were hit on the road. 
And um, and most of the people complaining about this, they're not vegetarians. They don't go and sit in the kill line at the abattoir. So it, it's just cultural. And uh, the more we push to change the, the culture around this, the, the better we'll be. Great. I'm, we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to come to Barry now. And Barry, um, you know, I'd love to hear your views about culture, but also that how do we bring people with us and help them understand? Because one of the questions talked a bit about the fact that a lot of this discussion is focused on terrestrial invasive species, pests and weeds, but we've we've also talked about the uh, the crabby frog and aquatic invasive species. Um, and you know, I guess you might have thought a bit about that, how we can care about all the invasive species threats. So what, what's your view about um, how we're going to help people understand? Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it's really that case of um, it, it's not my issue until it's in my backyard. Um, and, 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 but sadly, people are still missing, um, you know, not, not, not all um, invasive species are as ugly as a cane toad. Um, you know, and, and I guess that's that's the other part of the, the message in the story is is some of sometimes those um, um, indeed microorganisms that people see can um, and people to respond to that sort of stuff. Um, so it's yeah, it, and they're hard messages to sell. Um, but certainly being able to recognize that that it is an issue. Um, and two, it's in your backyard already. Um, you know, there's already invasive species there. Um, and three, you know, like the, the actions that you can take to not just manoeuvre yourself and, and your community, um, but to get um, government moving as well. You know, they're real steps that we can take um, and I encourage people to look at those steps and, and, and take those steps. Yeah, look, that's a great way to finish. Um, and uh, look, the wisdom from the three of you, that's been, been great. I think it at least gives us some hope and some ways forward. So look, I'm gonna bring this to a close now. We're out of time, um, but I wanna just thank our three guests. So we've got Barry Hunter, our special guest who was a co-author of the State of Environment Report. Uh, we've got Richard Swain, our indigenous ambassador, and we've got Tim Lowe, uh, author, biologist, and co-founder of Invasive Species. So thank you, the three of you for joining us in, that, in this really interesting, engaging conversation. Now, we had a, over 54 questions come through on the chat uh, through the Q&A. So look, appreciate everyone. What, what this is telling me that there's a lot of interest in these issues and not just about what we're talking about today, but more broadly. So we'll take that on board. We'll aim to put replies to those questions up on our website. We also put a live, this recording of this webinar in case you want to share it with a friend. Um, or you know, know someone who missed it out. So that'll go up on our Aliens Among Us webpage. And also we did a survey just at the end of the last one about future topics. So we're definitely going to take all those ideas on board. So the next Aliens Among Us will be in about two months from now. We haven't worked out the, the subject, but we've definitely got a lot of topics of interest. So keep an eye out on your inbox for news about that. So look, thanks again, everyone for joining us. Thanks for our three guests. And I think it's been a fascinating discussion and I'll see you next time. See you later, thank you. Bye.